G'day folks, welcome back to the channel. Today I've decided to uh, do what I probably shouldn't do and work on this here Pioneer CTF 615. The original idea for today was to uh, go in with the uh, Bose virtual imaging array and get that fixed up, but uh, my brain just decided, no, I don't want to do that. Let's go with an older two-head cassette deck so I can sort of cleanse my palate after having to work on these high dollar, extremely expensive, and extremely complicated tape decks that I've been working on lately. But before we do that, I should mention that I now have a uh, bench power supply coming. It's just been ordered this morning. So we're going to get back to the uh, TCK666ES as soon as possible. I'm really anxious to hear how that records, but uh, We'll have to uh, deal with that another day. Today we're going to deal with this guy, because I want to get another fluoroscan unit working. And before someone asks, I know I haven't gotten back to the uh, big Pioneer receiver yet, the SX3700. Reason is, I had to wait until I built my uh, new test bench speakers to get that thing started. And the test bench speakers are finally under construction now, so... Uh, yeah, the enclosures are already built and glued together and screwed together. I just have to uh, go outside and cut the uh, driver holes and uh, do all the finishing touches, and then those will be ready. And then when it comes to the receiver, I'll have to film segments here and there as I find the time. It's probably going to be a slow process of getting that video done for the channel, but uh, yeah, I'll just basically work on it whenever I've got the time and then... Maybe by Christmas it'll be done. I hope so, anyway. I would love to start using it. But, uh, yeah, for now we're just going to get this thing going. I hope. Now, what's wrong with this? Well, we found out during the uh, 9 tape deck diagnosis video I did. A. All the belts are gone. And B. The capstan motor does not run. So, uh... I should tell you I've already gotten a head start on this by replacing some of the power supply capacitors. I decided I didn't want to go into this with the prospect looming of uh, some of those capacitors shorting out and blowing out a bunch of electronics in this thing, so I went ahead and replaced some preemptively. But uh, we'll get it open right now and I'll show you exactly what I've done. So the new capacitors are all in here. These are Panasonic FR. They're one-for-one one replacements. I'm not upsizing anything in this deck. I'm just going one-to-one one for replacements. And I've done all the ones back in here, too. This one's audio grade. And it's audio grade because I keep forgetting to order the actual correct parts from DigiKey anytime I do an order. Well, I've got another order in right now that has those parts, but... These are 4700 or 47 microfarad at 50 volts. All I had was the audio grade stuff to go in there, so yeah. The rest of these are all done with whatever I've got. And you'll see one more Panasonic there. I think that's an FM. But uh, yeah, in terms of other capacitors for this, I'll probably do what I did with the CTF 900 and recap the audio chain with the uh, audio grade stuff, but. Uh, I have to identify which ones those are yet. We need to get started on this, so first thing I want to do is I want to check the uh, the power supply for the capstan motor, which is down here. That's one pin right there, and I think this is the other pin. So I'm going to get my meter out, zoom you out to where you can see it. And then we're going to check to see if there's power getting to the motor itself, because uh, the motor does not run in any mode. And I believe it should fire up when the uh, power to the deck turns on. So, uh, yeah, if I can just get this connected, like so. And get it plugged in somehow. All right, let's fire it up and see what happens. Oh, 
Okay, nothing on the meter. Oh, wait. 14.46. So yeah, it's getting power right now. It's just not running. Let me tap the back of the motor here. Still no running. I'll get my uh, dental pick down in there and start fiddling with the pulley and no even that's not getting it to run so I noticed while I was changing out the caps that uh, there was an awful lot of belt goo down in there around the uh, motor shaft so uh, yeah we have to open up that motor anyway to get that belt goo out of the uh, front bearing but uh, yeah I'm not exactly sure whether or not this motor is going to work again so I do have those knockoff motors from China I may have to put in this thing. And that will be a temporary measure. I've got a more permanent measure in mind, which will remain secret for now, because uh, the uh, deck I got for parts that would contribute a capstan motor for this, well, it's going to indirectly contribute a capstan motor for this. There's another deck that needs a capstan motor that needs slightly better quality than this one's getting. But yeah, I basically bought another parts deck. It's going to get its own video. And it's going to contribute a capstan motor and... Well, actually, I shouldn't say much more than that about it, so... Yeah, we got to get into this. So, how do I get at the transport to service this? Pioneer just had to make this so everything is hardwired in this machine. So, this is going to be tricky to service. Probably going to have to pull off the front panel. I don't see any better way to do this. We'll get the tape door off. And yeah, I want to clean the front panel anyway, so... Gotta do it anyway. And as we're doing this, I just want to make a few comments about uh, last week's video of the JVC TDV 931. Yes, I do realize that the, uh, the heads are now out of alignment because I didn't really have things set up properly to uh, align them. Basically, the, the way those, that deck is right now, it's basically just temporary until I can get rubber parts in for it. I'm probably going to swap out both pinch rollers, and it needs an idler for sure. But uh, even with that, I am absolutely staggered how good that deck is, even out of alignment. And you will have possibly noticed that uh, down in the uh, video description is my uh, top five tape deck rankings. And that machine is currently at number one. And you might be wondering if... Uh, if that deck was worth it as a $200 premium over the A&D machine. And uh, that's actually not so easy a question to answer for me, honestly, because the A&D is already such a friggin' good machine that you'd think it would possibly not be worth the uh, $200 extra it costs to get the uh, TDV 931. But you have to realize the uh, 931 costs as much as it did because it had to be shipped here from Japan. That is an extremely heavy tape deck, thanks to that gigantic wooden thing that's on the bottom of it. So, uh, yeah. The other thing you have to keep in mind, too, is that... Uh, the A&D machine is very often much more expensive than I paid for mine. 
Remember, mine came with chips out of the side panel. So you have to consider that too. So when you consider everything, I have to say that yes, the 931 was worth the 800 and some dollars I paid for it. I'm probably gonna be into it for like 850 once the rubber parts get here if it needs. And where did that screw go? That's there somewhere. I'm just trying to pull the beauty plate off here so I can get access to the inside of the mechanism. Okay, we've got a rubber idler because of course we do. I hope I've got something that'll work in there. Oh, there's my other screw I lost. But yeah, I've heard before that... Uh, there's the idler right there. I'll have to try and find a replacement for that. I might have one, I might not, I don't know. But I've heard that uh, people describe JVC decks as having in their own signature sound. And some people have said the uh, signature sound on those things is moist. Which I didn't really... I couldn't really see that until I listened to the TDV 931. Yeah, I can kind of see it now, but uh, I don't know that I would call it moist. That's not the right word for me. The right word for me is sultry. That's kind of how it sounds to me. Pull that off so I can get access to the... Uh... Oh wait, those aren't transport screws at all. But yeah, I would call it sultry, not moist. I can see why people would find it objectionable too, but... Uh... Oh, where's my screwdrivers again? But the A and D machine is a very dry recording sounding unit, if that makes any sense. It makes copies that are identical to the source. It's like a CD player with tape hiss. That's what it sounds like. The 931, on the other hand, has the same ruler flat frequency response. It just has this character to the sound that you don't get from the A&D machine. And I'm finding that I actually prefer that for my vaporwave recordings that I've been making lately. You wouldn't always want that if you're trying to make a recording that's faithful to the source. For that, you'd you would want the A&D machine, but uh, I find myself preferring for Vaporwave machines that have a little bit more of a character to them. And the 931 has that character. And the, uh, the big Iowa machines have that character too. They sound different, but... Uh, I mean, different from the 931, but still. Hopefully you guys know what I'm talking about, because I don't know what I'm talking about half the time, so. Okay, transport's loose. Now, how many of these frickin' wires do I have to deal with here? Certainly gonna have to cut some zip ties. This one looks like it's not original. So it's possible this has been serviced before. But yeah, we'll get back to the 931 as soon as possible. I can't make any promises because I gotta order rubber parts for it, but yeah, we'll do what we can. All right, now how am I gonna be able to service this? Basically have to do it inside the deck. And oh, look, there's our belts. We found the belts for this machine right there. Gonna have to clean that up. That's going to be fun. Okay, so I cleaned up all the old belt goo down under there, and I think our next step is going to be to uh, remove this top plate here and set it aside. This is responsible for going into fast forward and rewind, I think. 
fairly sure on that. Just basically trying to get as much of this out of the way as possible so we can actually work on this thing. Okay, so there's this little fork here. This goes on a, uh, a tab way down in there. I'll see if I can show it to you. So you have to keep this in mind. This is the little uh, peg that fork goes on. It basically shoves the idler back and forth is what that does. I do believe. This effectively frees up some wires here, so we can uh, do a little more work, maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. This looks terrible to work on. Oh, there's some more belt right there. We'll just get that nasty stuff out of here. And on the subject of belts, I've tried to uh, find the belts this thing needs, but uh, the one for the uh, for the uh, this thing here may be a little tricky because uh, apparently I'm running low on my 1.2 millimeter belts. The one it needs is a uh, 110 millimeter internal circumference, and I couldn't find that. I do have a 100 millimeter internal internal circumference belt, so I will try that one. I don't know if it's gonna work, but uh, if it doesn't, I'll just have to try the uh, the one millimeter ones I've got instead. So let me put those screws out of the way. Actually, it doesn't look like it's real terrible to work on this transport. Just have to get access to this motor here because uh, the motor is not functioning. So, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the motor leads so I can see where they go later. And then I'll just pull the motor out for now and then we'll get inside of it, I think. I want to get access to this flywheel to clean it up as well, so... Yeah, I guess we have to flip her over for that. See if I can figure out how to get this uh, motor out of there. Okay, I think I figured out how this works now. The whole plate is held in with two screws, one here and one up here. I hope you can see that. And then it comes off the back, I think. We'll see if we can do it without pulling these big solenoids off, or this one big solenoid off, I should say. Because obviously we need to do something about this motor, otherwise this thing isn't going to work again. We'll deal with idlers later. Yeah, that's how that works. And it comes right out. Look at that. And yeah, I don't know if you can see it too well, but there is a lot of old crappy belt goo down in there. I had that problem with the uh, Sansui D905R. It had 0.35% wow and fluttered until I took that motor apart and cleaned it up. So, uh, no time like the present. Let's deal with this motor now, shall we? We'll crack it apart first, and then we'll see what the heck is going on with it. All right, before we get into this, here's my replacement motor, should I need it. Nothing special at all. Much smaller than the original, but uh, that's the way it goes with these Chinese replacements. That looks like a good height to set the... Uh, Pull at. Yeah, what did I tell you? Belt goo. Gonna have to clean that up. 
And I can't use acetone. Because plastic. All right, everything's relatively clean except for my fingers now, but uh, I got the pulley cleaned off and I got as much of the uh, rubber goo off the uh, end of the motor as possible. You really want to uh, make sure you clean up as much as you can of the old belt goo that's on the motor shaft because uh, otherwise you're going to have to pull the uh, the belt goo through the bearing and uh, then you've got even more of a mess to deal with. But uh, we'll start getting into this motor now, at least we'll try to. This one looks like a bit of a pain to get into. I'm already thinking about just replacing the motor and being done with it, but... Uh, it's really in our best interest to try to bring this one around if we can, because uh, the Chinese knockoff motors are not very good. All right, we're in. Oh, gee, I don't know. Do you think it has a problem? I just can't tell. This thing's been blowed up real good. Looks like that diode let go or something. At least I think it's a diode. Pull the isolator off there and then we'll see if these transistors are any good. I wonder if I've even got diodes for this thing. If I can even tell what the polarity is, that would be another thing. Oh, I'm just noticing, look how corroded the, uh, the adjustment pot is for this. You know what, I think I'm just going to put this motor aside and... Uh, I'll just go ahead and install the replacement. I think I would rather just do that. I don't want to work too hard today. So will this motor fit in there? Eh, not really. We're going to have to install it as it is, like this. So yeah, I'm sure this pulley is going to fit. Yes, it does. So yeah, never mind, we're going to just go ahead and replace the motor. I would like to uh, get the mu metal out of this thing to, uh, to reuse it though, because uh, this is for my own personal collection, so see if I can get it out of this container here. There it goes. Yeah, yeah, I think I can make this work. Just got to wrap it a bunch of times with electrical tape to hold it steady. But yeah, it's no wonder that motor wouldn't work. Let me uh, fire up the soldering iron here and I'll put some leads on this and we can install it. All right, there you go, one new capstan motor. Is it perfect? No, but it doesn't have to be. It's temporary. And if you're wondering about this uh, KN2 on the back there, this was while I was, or this was made while I was comparing using these motors on the uh, XK007 back when I was still experimenting with that. Motor works, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just got markings on it so I could tell it apart from the others. For a temporary motor, this will be fine, I'm sure. So all i got to do is put that in and wire it up and should work, I think. Okay, so the motor's installed. I hope I got it set so I can uh, actually get in there to adjust this when it, the transport's in place, but uh, who knows. Now we're going to continue on, and I'm noticing I can't get access to the flywheel unless I take this... Uh, solenoid off, so uh, we're going to have to do that. 
and I will do this on camera so you can see where the solenoid goes. There's a little arm it engages with right there. You have to make sure it goes back in. So I'm going to use my big vessel screwdriver because it's the best for this kind of thing. Take out the two screws. And we'll just set the solenoid off to the side, I guess. Remember, this pin goes in to the arm right like that. So keep that in mind. And it goes without saying that if you're laying stuff off to the side next to the transformer like this, make sure there's no power to the unit. So out comes the uh, flywheel. I don't believe there are any con oil control washers on the front of this thing. I do not see any anyway. There's a little spring we gotta watch out for. Right there. Just goes on right over top of this black post there. So I'm going to take that off. Set it to the side where I can't lose it, because Lord knows that's a problem around here. And uh, this is plastic. There is a metal capstan bushing in front, but it's mostly plastic. Dang it. Can't use my acetone. I gotta use isopropyl alcohol for this clean out. Acetone may be safe for this type of plastic, or it may not. I would just as soon not find out the hard way. And I gotta check that I got all the fibers out. So we gotta service this now. We gotta clean it up real good. And for that, I can use the acetone because we're just doing bare metal here, and this is not the world's heaviest flywheel, I'll tell you that right now. But it's perfectly acceptable for what this deck is, and I'm going to take these two screws right here that are rolling around and put it up with the uh, capstan motor plate, which is where they belong. First up, the capstan itself. Lots of gunk on there. It's going to be old oil, I'm sure. There is a little washer in here. We're going to want to put a little bit of grease on the uh, end of that, I think, because there's a, that's where that spring rides up against. I have a deck tech belt I'm going to try in this thing. Five millimeters wide. It should work. As far as uh, the capstan goes. Uh, there's a bunch of crud on here I'm going to have to uh, go a little harder on than straight paper towel with, I think. But that's fine. I can go in with the uh, scotch Bright too. It's no problem. And this bearing looks dry as a bone, too, so we're going to have to deal with that. All right, so the flywheel's about as clean as I can get it. Just getting out my uh, molly coat now. Oops, we don't want molly coat on the actual capstan. Just want a little dab like so. Right there, where the spring rides. And I gotta clean that again. Because I got molly coat up where I didn't want it. Now, how am I going to oil this thing? Good question. I don't know why they would have this so that there's no bearing back here, but they must have had their reasons, I guess. So we got to do the front bearing as well. 
see if I can get this to a point you can actually see me do it. There, that's four drops total for the whole bearing, so that ought to be enough. Should check the pinch roller while I'm at it. Pinch roller is okay. It can be reused, I think. Just pulling the oil off the uh, front of the bushing here before I reinstall the uh, flywheel. Must not forget spring. And flywheel goes on. Seems pretty well lubed up to me. It's going to be moving in and out as we do the service because I'm not going to put the uh, motor plate back on yet. I will, however, put the solenoid back on. That should hold her for a little while. Might have to adjust this solenoid later because I took it off and wasn't paying attention to how it was aligned. But uh, maybe I'll find some witness marks here and I'll be able to figure that out. Okay, and I do have witness marks and they are lined up now. Witness marks are uh, little places on uh, metal surfaces or other surfaces where you can tell that something used to be. In this case, it's a couple of lock washers. So yeah, that's good now. And uh, this wheel is moving fairly freely, so uh, we're gonna have to clean it, but I think that's all we need to do on that. There's a lot of old belt goo down in this pulley here, which is cleaning up nicely, I should say. And in fact, I am happy with that as is. And we just lost the eject button off the front. I'll just put it back on again. It already fell off once. Got to clean that at some point. Now, do I want to put belts on? I think that's actually the next step. Then we'll work on the front of the transport. So let me get my belts here. And I hope this is the right one for the, uh, or I hope this will work for the, uh, for the uh, real drive. I don't know if it will. Fairly certain this deck tech belt is the correct one for the uh, capstan drive though. So let's see if I can get this stuff on. Maybe if I use a pick dentalis, I will get it on there. And it is on. Oh, that's right. I got to molly coat the bearing on this thing. Clean it up first while I'm at it. Well, come on now. You came out of there. That's your home. Are you too good for your home? Answer me. Uh, this is kind of interfering. Great. I was afraid of that. Out it comes again, and I got to clock the motor so it, the terminal's clear. Oh, well. We'll get her done. All right, so the uh, motor plate's back on, and everything seems happy now. I did finally manage to find a way to get that motor in there so I could still get access to the adjustment hole, I think. Not sure yet. I'm still not so sure about this uh, belt I've got on the... Uh, lost the eject again. Well, I'm going to have to clean it anyway, so I'm just going to leave it. Yeah, I'm still not sure about this uh, smaller belt up to the uh, fast wind flywheel. We'll take a look at the wild flutter at some point because we got to adjust it anyway. And uh, if I need to put on a looser belt, then we'll know it then because uh, the motor will bog down and uh, we won't be able to actually get it up to the right speed. So, uh, yeah, 
I think we're ready to go around to the front of the transport now, so uh, how's about we do that? Let me see if I can find a way to do that. That doesn't involve a bunch of wires breaking. So, my main question is, what am I going to do about this idler? It's using one of those weird lock washers on it. I don't think I'm going to mess with that. I'm going to try to get the idler off of there without uh, messing with that. So I don't know if there's a good way for me to show you this process. Well, maybe that way will do. And uh, because I can't get that idler wheel off, yeah, just it seems like that's going to just destroy itself if I try to do that. So uh, we're going to have to pry this off with some tools. You run the real risk of uh, damaging the, uh, the plastic when you do this, but I don't think I've got much other choice in this instance. I just got my fingernail in there, so easy peasy lemon squeezy. Now we're going to have to find an idler for that. I hope I've got one. So we'll measure it first for your benefit. I got a bulk pack from China, a bunch of different size idlers. It might be in there. Okay, internal diameter is 11 millimeters, it looks like. Outer diameter is... 15.3, 15.5, we'll call it 16, and uh, the thickness is 1.5 millimeters. Oh, great. I wonder if a 2 millimeter will fit. Let me see what I got. Okay, the Chinese idler pack to the rescue. This is the new one on top. It looks absolutely identical. See if we can measure here. 15.8, outer. 11.4, inner. It'll work. It needs cleaning because uh, it's kind of not the best, but uh, I'm looking at the old one. It's not real far gone yet, but. Uh, I'm definitely glad to be changing it, so uh, I'm glad I bought this already. That's going to come out whenever I have real difficult stuff that uh, I can't seem to find any idlers for. So let me see if I can get this into the uh, actual transport. and We'll just go from there. Oh, I didn't check thickness. 1.9 millimeters, so... I hope it fits. Well, it went on. It's not really seating itself directly into the uh, pulley yet. So maybe this thing wants its 1.5 millimeter. Well, I got some of it to go in. That's going to have crazy wow and flutter if I keep it like this, though. It's not seated properly on most surfaces. So maybe this won't work, this idler. Maybe I have to go to my O-ring stash in order to find one for this. Yeah, that, that is not going to work. I'm going to have to go to the O-rings. All right, so I did find an O-ring that looks like it's going to work. I'm not exactly sure. Well, no, I'm not comfortable with this. The size I was using is 12 millimeter by 1.5, but uh, not happy with it. So we are going to try to uh, rebuild the original O-ring. I hate to do that. I would rather put a new one in, but uh, the old O-ring is mostly okay. I think it'll work out. 
at least for now, if I go ahead and rubber renew the thing. I hate to use rubber renew on any type of permanent repair, but like I said, this is for my personal collection, so uh, I'm not that concerned about it. Watch out for idlers with this machine, because uh, this is not the, uh, the easiest thing to find. Yeah, I'd be sunk right now if, uh, if this idler was in any worse shape than it is. And if I'd actually destroyed it getting it off, I'd be equally sunk. So keep that in mind. I'm going to do one more pass with the Rubber Renew. Fresh Rubber Renew. And then it should be good for a while. You can see not a lot of stuff came off there, so it's really not in the worst shape. Uh, but before I put the Rubber Renew away, we got to check this pinch roller. Actually, the pinch roller is really good on this, so uh, I am only going to clean it. That's right, I've got Kim wipes. I forgot I got these things. We'll use Kim wipes on the pinch roller. That way there will be no fibers. And I'll just use isopropyl alcohol for this. It is quite dirty. Just go over it one more time. Oh, I see. The idler is for playback only, it looks like. Fast wind is done with gears. I should take a look at those gears and make sure they're in decent shape. They look okay, I'm going to say. I'm taking a look at the uh, brakes as well. They kind of need cleaning. Head block is moving well, so I don't think I'll do anything there. This could be so much easier if Pioneer would have just put some wires on connectors instead of this nonsense, but they did what they did. Okay, what else do we got to do? Actually, I think that's darn near it, except for cleaning the heads. I'd break out the microscope and have a look at the heads too, but uh, I don't think there's much point doing that on this machine, really. It's not the highest end machine in my collection, I'll tell you that. This doesn't need to record. It will never record. It's here to sit on a shelf and look pretty is what it's here for. And also it has to work, obviously. All right, now I'm going to molly coat where I can here. Let's see if I can show you what I'm molly coating. Basically, I want to get in here where this little wheel is, or this uh, linkage is. I want to get some molly coat in there, and I got way too much molly coat where I don't want it, and now it's on the idler tire. Great. I'll clean it again. We can do that. Get the molly coat away from where we don't want it. And I think we're good to start reassembling. I'm anxious to see how this works. So. We can disentangle this thing now. Don't know if that's possible. Thanks to the wire spaghetti Pioneer's got going on in here. But it looks like we're making out okay on that regard. Okay, what is holding you up now? Wires is wires is are holding you up. Okay, that's roughly how that goes back in. Have to reinstall this uh Plate, of course, but with luck that won't be too bad. So I guess we get to molly coat some more. 
Just put some on the fork, like so. That's what I'll do. And yeah, we should probably refresh the grease that's up here too, but I'll do this with the, uh, the plate back on. All right, that should do the trick. Now, what I have to do is I have to uh, A, hook up the capstan motor, B, clean up the front panel, and C, put everything back together, I guess. Okay, so I've got everything installed again, and I am happy to report that we have a functional transport, it seems like. Except for one thing, no counter belt yet, so we're going to do that now. now. I've got the old one right here. 108.7, which is 216-ish internal circumference. So uh, I'm going to divide that by 1.07, and I'm going to try to find one in my 0.7 millimeter belts for that. So let me see what I can find. All right, I got one. 100 millimeters times 2, which is 200 millimeters internal circumference. So let me see if I can get this installed, and I realize you can't see the uh, front part of this in order to see exactly where this is going, but uh, I can show you in a, a minute or five once I get this belt strung up. If I can get it around the uh, take up here, that's half the battle, and I've just won half the battle. Okay, so that works. We'll go around to the front here, fight the camera gimbal, and this is where that belt is. So should work. So how's about we uh, plug her in and I'll show you exactly how she's working. Power is applied. And you can see the shaft is turning, which tells me the motor's running. Rewind. Fasty forwardy, play, head block is engaged, it looks like. I think we're good to go. Pause works. So, what's next? Well, we gotta get back in here and clean the record switch and uh, zip tie all these wires out of the way and uh, check the wow and flutter and uh, well, actually, let's see if it plays first. Must be clean! I'm not pushing down real hard on this. It feels like it wants to uh, separate this lens here. So I'm just merely cleaning it the best I can. All right, folks, I'm just setting up to do the wow and flutter stuff now and uh, speed calibration. And I want to caution you, don't get your hopes up. This is not going to be a barn burner for Wow and Flutter. But uh, we're going to find out where it sits. I'm going to use my Denon 3 kilohertz tape for this. And I hope this thing gives me audio out, because I don't even know if that part of it works. But uh, I've got all the controls clean now. The front panel's nice and clean. So uh, not too much left to do on this. So... Uh, Let's see what we get here. We've got audio on left channel only, it looks like. But uh, that's good enough for me to dial this in, so i got a ceramic screwdriver. If I can get it in here. We'll see if we can bring her up. All right, right there, I think I'm good with. Wow and Flutter is not so good. 0 0.15. Yeah, that's that Chinese motor at fault. Look at the speed drift. It's going all over the place. But uh, can't help it. This is what I've got. Like I said, I've got plans for a permanent replacement. But uh, we got to figure out what's going on with the audio because it's... Only giving me audio on one channel there, it looks like.
we might have some more to diagnose here. But uh, as you can see, it is pulling tape through. Doing just fine. Yeah, we've just got one channel missing. I wonder if it's just in the meter or if it's in the audio output itself. Let me hook up audio and we'll see what happens. All right, I've got the audio hooked up and we'll see if there's only one channel with a uh, audio tape here. Very possibly there is. You know what? We've got audio on both channels, so there's an issue with the uh, meter circuit. Okay, so I'm going to have to go looking for that now. Well, I found a problem. It is on the meter board. Let's see if I can find it here. I have to use my uh, phone screen, but uh, at least one of these solder joints is not good. So I'm going to go through and reflow this. And hopefully that'll bring the, the uh, other channel on the meter back. All right, folks, I got 99% of that board resoldered. I skipped some of it, but uh, let's find out if we got uh, full meter action now. I love when tools get in the way, don't you? Okay, that's not the problem, so we got to continue looking for this. Okay, folks, I had the scope on the uh, deck, and uh, the point where the uh, signal leaves the audio board, there is audio there going to the front panel. So uh, what do you want to bet that one of these two controls is dirty? Let's fire it up and let's find out. And here you can actually see the, the natural color of these uh, Blue Line Pioneer vacuum fluorescent displays. It's green, because of course it is. Anyhow, let's see what we can do for this. I think it's the top one that's the one we want to play with. Maybe not. Well, that is strange. It's not the controls, I don't think, but uh, let me do some measurements off camera. It could be one of these two capacitors is gone as well. Or it could be wires. Let me continue to poke around and I'll see what I can find. All right, folks. Well, I found the problem and the news isn't good. The driver IC for the right channel has failed. It's the only conclusion I can reach. I've got signal going all the way into the IC, and it's just not doing anything. I can wet finger it, and I can just about get something to deflect on there. I'll show you. Yeah, see? If I wet finger it, so yeah, that's the problem. I got to replace that IC. I guess I'll start looking for one, and hopefully that fixes it. But uh, for now, this is going to have to be the end of it for for now. I'll deal with this another time. But we got her working. It's got both channels. It's playing fantastically, except for the fact it's got a Chinese motor in it. But uh, yeah, this is as far as we can take this for now. Everything works except for the uh, the right channel level meter. And I'm not that concerned about that for now. We got her up and running. That ain't not half bad. So yeah, I guess that's going to be it for today, guys. See you in the next video. Take care.